Good afternoon and welcome back. Our next session is presented by our friends at Mead and Hunt. John, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan Meyer with Mead and Hunt. I'm the uh, GIS practice leader. And as I understand it, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the FAA's ADIP program from a consultant's perspective and highlighting the use of GIS at uh, airports and within aviation. So uh, I was able to talk at the uh, conference a few years ago in Minot, back when this was Aegis and it was UMass. Uh, now it's ADIP and it, it's certainly more than just a, a branding change from FAA. Uh, th this is really the direction that the Aegis was all, always built toward. And that's that it's the uh, data and information portal. It's the spot for a whole bunch of information that uh, the FAA is trying to get into the system and making this the, the portal that uh, airports consultants, the state, and the FAA use to access this. So there are uh, different roles within the ADIP. And depending on who you are, you get to do different stuff on the ADIP. The, the, the first role would be an airport manager, you know, the listed airport manager in a 5010. All the other airport employees fall under a separate category. Then uh, state DOT people have their own categories. Consultant that I'm in is the most limited category because I can't make changes on my own for an airport. And then the FAA has their own breakdown of uh, roles as well, based on their different uh, lines of business. So I'm going to share a look at my ADIP. So this is, this is what I see when I log in. Everyone sees uh, these same basic tools. Sometimes there's some more tools that show up based on who you are and how you're logged in. Uh, because I'm not an airport, I don't see the airport master record and the methods to edit that data. But I do see modification of standards. And let me turn on the highlighter, or the laser pointer. So I can see the modification of standards, which is anything that has been shared direct to me as a consultant would show up in this modification of standards. Throughout all these, I don't see the button that says create a new survey project, create a new modification of standards. That's all limited within the uh, other user types. But if I do go into a modification standard that uh, I was granted access to, you can see one of the reasons this isn't called a GIS page is this is just document management. They need to track the modification of standards. This is a consistent place to show who did what and when. So you could see this was just uh, a bunch of stuff I don't know much about, but uh, looking for P403 and P501 and running this mods to standard up to the ADO and back for approval. This is something that's tracked and I can go back and see all of the other modification standards. You can see some that are still open and on their way all the way up to headquarters back, depending on the type of form that you're filling out. Um, the other thing, um, and I think John Mayfield touched on the reasons why earlier from the Office of Airports, but uh, there's a new tool that came on in 2021 into the ADIP called the RSA tool. So it's an RSA inventory. I believe this is the tracking side of uh, all of the requirements. This is something new, so it's not rolling out uh, to a lot of airports yet. But what we're seeing, the the important thing to know is this is something that's initiated by the FAA. So they will tell the airport if there is a need to move this forward. And uh, some airports can be created, can create an RSA within a DOT requirement. And that's going to be those GA airports that uh, meet some requirements that uh, I'm not too familiar with because I don't take that level of training. There's also a Windrose tool. 
that um, you can search any airport or any weather station and generate a windrose. This isn't really something that uh, is, is looked at frequently, but this is the source and this is where it's been moved to so that it should, all windrows calculations should be coming through here. You can see here that, uh, you know, just searching Rapid City, it does have all 10 years of data are available and then it's not triggering you into another system. Um, the next one I wanted to spend a, a little bit more time on is uh, this obstacle data. So the flight procedures obstacle authoritative data throughout the country is available for download through the ADIP portal. And this is the uh, obstacle data that flight procedures development would see if they look in live. This looks into their database, the, the one database that's authoritative for the country and will pull data out. So this enables uh, any user to just download the data and start uh, utilizing it. So I downloaded Grand Forks and you can see here the 17 right approach. And this is a screenshot out of Google Earth. I just dropped this into Google Earth uh, to look to see if I agreed with, you know, where things were being mapped and you can kind of see, you know, the lights and the, the fence lines. But it, right here, there's a 50 foot tall tree. And if I zoom in, I don't see a tree there. And I don't see a 50 foot tall tree here either. So one of the things in Google that you can do is use the uh, go back in time. And if I go back to 1997, there are those two 50 foot tall trees. The airport cut them down 20 years ago, but there was not an official method to take it out of the system for the airport. For the most part, this isn't going to be not directly in the approach, but it's still something that uh, if you look around the airports, you could probably find uh, you know, a, a large number of examples of some database cleanup that needs to occur so that you don't get an erroneous notification and saying you're gonna lose your night circling or you're gonna lose this procedure uh, because of a penetration to potentially a tree that was removed 20 years ago. So this isn't just stuff off the ends of runway. It, it, it can be impacting a lot. This is the Willow Run Airport in the Detroit metro area. And uh, this is the old World War II B-24 bomber plant at Willow Run, part of the Ford Assembly. And you can see here it's correctly mapped. There's smokestacks, there's corners, there's lights and everything out in the parking lots. And because of that, or that's one of the reasons that uh, the airport had to displace its threshold. Uh, you can see here, this is a picture from 2010 and a lot's happened at that airport since then. You'll notice that 14 is going to go away as well as the entire bomber plant. So that, that plant is now gone. Those close in obstructions are now gone and it's replaced with what appears to be quite an um, intense highway network that doesn't seem very logical that close to a runway end. Uh, but this is a closed loop for uh, autonomous vehicle testing. So if you follow this on-ramp around, it just loops you right back into where you started. So these are not roads based on their classification. It's a training facility. But there's still a smokestack according to the FAA database. There's still building corners. And what uh, the Wayne County Airport Authority is trying to do right now with their runway project is to also get rid of their displaced threshold. So in order to do that, you need to tell the FAA to remove all this information from the database. So the method to do that is within ADIP. And that's uh, under an ADIP survey project, and they have a project type called EB91. So just uh, named after the engineering brief that talks about obstacle and vegetation management. This is a fairly straightforward 
process that uh, the airport or the airport consultant can work to mark all of the obstacles that should be just removed from the database and they can be permanently deleted based on the acceptance of the airport sponsor. So you can see here, Teresa is not the airport manager. It's not a manager level responsibility, but uh, the airfield facilities person was able to say, yes, all of these are gone. You don't need to send in a picture that shows that a tree has been removed. You just need to uh, accept it as the airport and then they will remove those uh, from the national database. This, if you've seen other ADIP survey projects, and I'll show a different one later, there's sometimes steps that fill the entire screen for the process flow to get this all done. For the obstacle removal, it's very simple. You give them the points, the airport says these points are removed, they remove them from the database. It is possible to use this also for uh, tree trimming. So if, if you get into um, having to trim a tree and need to report that so that uh, you can show that you've done what's required, then you would attach that standard 1A survey letter with a signature from an engineer or a surveyor, and you'd attach that into this report, and that would work its way through the system as well to remove, uh, remove obstacles that are demolished or cut down and short obstacles and give them a new survey date so that you can see what date that 1A survey of the uh, height of the tree was done. Um, from my perspective, one of the bigger uses of the ADIP SIR projects now is the design as built tool. So this, this is really what comes into play if you are moving a threshold or getting a new procedure at your airport. And the entire point of this is really the coordination between the many lines of business that get involved in a project like that. Uh, the people in the flight procedures office need to know the future runway and coordinates to develop the their new procedure. And they can't wait until you're done building it unless you wanna wait another couple of years until they're done with their process. So uh, the, the point of this design and then as built is to send the data in to the FAA, get it checked, then have it over to the flight procedures office and let them develop the procedure then when the construction is done, you can do your as built in. So you can see working down, there's quite a few uh, steps in this process, but you can send this design survey in. And as soon as the runway and, and the nav aids are designed, you can send that in and it lets them develop their procedures. Then once you get into that as built phase and the construction is done, then you work all the way down to doing this as built survey. And that survey is validating that the runway was built within the tolerances that you told the flight procedures office way back in the design stage. So as long as you're within three inches vertical and six inches horizontal, they are ready to publish the procedures. And this is something that, uh, you know, I'm a GIS person, so that seems close to me, but the engineers would say, if you're off by six inches, there's, there's quite a few more problems to be dealing with than just getting this procedure published. But it meets within the safety tolerances of the way the entire uh, process is set up and referenced in the advisory circular. So that's how you work through. And this ends up being a multi-year process. And I, you know, my personal experiences with this, I feel that in, in doing some of this, you need to get all of the different people involved in the project involved early. So that means meetings with flight procedures and uh, the ADO and other FAA parties in addition to the airport and the state to say, these are the dates we're looking for. This is our publication plan. This is where we want to be and make sure everyone is on the same page saying, this is what we are going to execute. 
execute. And that's going to make things run a whole lot smoother later on through the process. So that's, that's sort of what I wanted to talk about in terms of digging in, spending half the time looking just at what's on this ADIP site. There's certainly some of the other projects in the standard, the uh, get done for master plans and ALPs and the construction work that's not safety critical. All that stuff goes into the ADIP as well. Again, trying to make this authoritative data source for the nation with all the data that the airport and the FAA needs. I think the um, the next part of this is really to talk about not only how the FAA needs it, but to acknowledge that, you know, really this system is for the FAA and communicating data up and down into a national system, which isn't necessarily uh, the way that an airport is going to use the GIS. They're going to do this because they need to finish their projects, but this has been used a lot of places as a jumping off point for uh, additional GIS uh, as a tool for the airport. So the first thing here I wanted to highlight would be just using it for ease of communication. This is Rochester, Minnesota. It's a multi-year program where they are extending the runways, getting new procedures on both ends, shortening one end of the runway to meet a safety area. There's a lot of steps involved in this and just a simple tool to bring it to the meetings that allows you an interactive way to go between phases and start swapping out what they're seeing. Certainly you don't need to do GIS. I've seen great examples using CAD or BIM or other phasing, but this is a, a, a real nice use of what's available. And this is something that's shared out or available to be shared out to the public so that you can organize your primary phases here. There is no phase three on the map because it's, uh, there's, it's all pipeline construction at Rochester. So the numbers get a little off here, but you can look at these are the dates. These are the flight procedure requirements that uh, this phase will elevate the runway and five feet. So they're going to need to modify their procedures for that. So they need to, you know, have a discussion to say, what is the interim procedure and what are the requirements to get that procedure in place for the two years that that's going to be uh, in effect. Then the other thing would be looking at, uh, you know, when are pavements going to be opened and closed? So not just for flight procedures, but also starting to look at what else is the airport going to use something like this for because of the operations and the uh, tenants and the uh, ARF and getting all of these other people just in the way to say, you know, now we're in phase five, everyone can look at the, the phase five on the map and link this public map to people to help them better plan their uh, help them better, better plan the way they work at the airport. Uh, another direct example would be, uh, you know, looking at your height limitation, that this is Bismarck's height limitation that um, as part of the master plan, they had mapped all of their limitation contour elevations, 1680, 1690, 1700. And, um, uh, outlined how they could then use it against development. So you could see if this property is going to be redeveloped, they could use this to uh, give the top allowable elevation to the developer. We certainly don't know their final grading of what they're going to do on the site, but you can kind of see they get about 30 feet of space over here and it's down to about 20 feet over on the other end of their property. So giving information like this out to developers is an easy thing that can be done for uh, a lot of airports because you have this data that's coming with a lot of your projects. This is a GIS tool. You need to have a GIS 
capability and a little bit of training to uh, use something like this. But uh, the next thing I wanted to show would be, you know, just Google Earth. Here's the airspaces in La Crosse, Wisconsin. They have terrain penetration problems and they make available or the airport manager had available uh, just camsies. You can email it to people. Most everyone has Google Earth or certainly someone working with them that has Google Earth that they can just open this up and start to see what it is they're dealing with and sort of why the airport is concerned about this bluff here uh, because it is in line with the approach. Um, also looking at public information, uh, something just as simple as here are all of our hangars, click on them and find what leases are available. This is something that, you know, years ago, some of the small airport operators I was talking to were saying like, if they had this on a tablet, that would be what they wanted to do. Because then when they're talking to someone, you can click on it and find out and look at which, which one's available. And this is also something that can, because it's all public data and the way that GIS, if you are enabling it, can be shared to everyone, you can just link this on your website. There's not a lot of complexity towards doing something simple like drawing a box and saying Hangar 7 is available. You can certainly get more complicated and much more advanced how you use your GIS. And I think the, the biggest starting point that a lot of people get to uh, with this data coming out of the FAA Airports GIS is integrating it with their inspection. So if you're doing part 139 inspections, there is a bevy of choices from many different vendors that uh, you could go uh, low end affordable. You could spend six, seven figures if you wanted to really integrate everything in your system. So it, it's it's really the the needs of the airport that that would drive something like that. You can also just use the GIS tools that come with Esri, and I highlight Esri here because most of the airports that are owned or uh, uh, if there's a, uh, a city or a county involved in the ownership, there's Esri products available because they're used so extensively in municipal government. So this is something that typically just requires a call downtown to get. There are quite a few other common applications of what you would use GIS for or integrate it with document management. People want to just, you know, have that tablet out in the field and click on where you're standing and pop up the plan set for that area. The real common one, certainly BIM integration, when you have all this great CAD and BIM data that you don't want to keep it separate from your GIS so you can integrate it. Uh, utilities, maps, concessions, inspections. That's uh, another real common one that you can make a simple application or purchase a simple application to go out and just do your regular inspections. Uh, yes, our fire safety person, when they have a, a fire extinguisher in this hangar and they're storing their oils correctly. So all those things can be built in and it, it's really about the level of complexity that you need that you could get into noise and pavement and emergency response. So kind of expanding on, on just that view of what's in the airport, there's also the whole world around you, this whole concept of, of big data that there's an almost unbelievable amount of things being tracked about everything doing that it's, it's there and we can start integrating it into more things at the airport. Certainly radar and ADSB as that's coming on, you can get more and more information, but also you know, looking at the flight patterns and procedures and are people flying where they're supposed to be? I know the, um, 
Truckee Tahoe Airport in California, if you don't fly the noise pattern, they will contact the owner when they get a plane because they can run it back all the way to watching that plane come out of the hangar. So there's there's quite a bit of things you so put in time dependent weather to say if you're looking back three weeks ago at someone's flight, what was the weather that day? Uh, the other the next thing is looking at this GPS data coming out of your cell phone and all of these Internet of Things sensors. So you're being tracked as your phone is pinging in and checking into other things and all these sensors that people are putting in to airport terminals just to better serve the uh, better serve the public are collecting more data and you can start layering that in with census data and start looking at capacity information and pulling in data sets for origin and destination and TSA information. There's quite a bit out there. So as you start seeing these things, they're going to become more readily available to integrate into your decisions at the airports. So, you know, radar and ADSB. Uh, you can just ask your phone what flights are overhead and it will check your location and it will tell you all of the flights and how high up they are just by talking into your phone because all that data is available. So if there's a benefit to your airport, you can also figure out a way to catalog that data so that you could look at seasonal changes or look at statistics over the year or see who, what tenants leave for the uh, winter. Here's also, you know, being able to integrate that to see who's flying correctly in the patterns or what patterns you're expecting here, GA versus flight training, that they're always flying as much as they can, the same patterns, and identifying if there are people who are not flying those patterns. Here's, uh, uh, in talking about data from the, the GPS and the cell phones, this is just a, a verification for the data sources that are available. So the blue line is the TSA count at San Antonio, and the green line is the GPS estimate of the cell phones going through. So you can see that it's a, a number that you could definitely, over this one-year look, put a correlation to and start to use just GPS data to make assumptions. And also, we have all this census data available, so you can start running things back and say, okay, who went to Myrtle Beach? How much money did they make? What was their income? Where did they come from? That you can start to get a lot more information on the demand and the trends. And then as you get into, you know, looking at, you know, something that's pretty common to see would be the drive time, how far are people willing to drive? But then you can start to factor in additional pieces of this big data that you could look at the price people are willing to pay uh, you know what's the Canadian dollar doing against the US are you going to start expecting a lot of people coming down to fly out of the US airport are there local attractions that are going to drive people to go the extra distance to yours if they're also you know, going to want to go to Costco or Sam's or Shields once they're done with their flight or dropping someone off, that that sort of can drive extra attention to that. And then also looking at, you know, what are these airport amenities? Is that going to change someone's viewpoint? You know, electric vehicles are coming as the automakers transition to all electric. So does that mean that the airports that have the valet charging systems once they can do valet again is that going to drive a bunch of electric vehicle owners to go there so that when they get back from their trip their vehicle has a chance of starting so there's just a whole bunch of other that all have a spatial component in the gis and you can start to integrate those into your system and into your decisions so that the time that I had to speak. So I don't know if any questions came in. No, I have no questions for you at this time. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you much. Well, I, I notice I'm the uh, one standing between everybody in happy hour, so I apologize right up front for that. I'll try to uh, uh, be quick and brief. Uh, topic I have today is, is what's driving your airport project costs. So it was actually perfect sitting through the, the last several presentations with the FAA, the state, and even with uh, GIS to go over some of those things. Um, the uh, let me... ever wonder what's driving project costs i know i've been in the aviation community for um several years and uh i apologize as, as luck would have a technology wise my uh um my robo or Zumba has decided it didn't want to start up and clean my house, so stand by. Sorry about that. The oddities of COVID and things you don't plan on. Um, ever wonder what's driving project costs? I've been in the aviation community for over 30 years, 24 with the FAA, and uh, nine now in the consulting world. And this is one of the things that's been a question and a concern for many people from years and years is what drives project costs? Well, let's step back for a second. Let's talk a little bit about where the projects come from or the funding from that. A lot of this is issues that you guys may or may not know, but I thought it'd be good if we kind of start from the basics again. And where do we get the grant funding? Lindsay talked about all these different funds and seven different grant programs and things like that. Specifically on the AIP grants, where do those funding come from? The airport trust funds. That's one of the things important to know that it comes from things that are ticket taxes and stuff like that. The airport trust fund was created back in 1970s. As a lot of us are, are very fiscally conservative, we worry about taxes and things like that. But these taxes actually are things that we utilize for our uh, uh, projects, whether they're terminals, runways, things like that. So the airport trust fund developed back in 1970s or 1970, it was derived from excise tax on passengers, cargo and fuel. This is just a real quick graphic of it. I won't go into details, but for the bulk of it, it's passengers. Um, then you get into some of the international uh, fees that we charge, and then you get into fuel tax and things such as that as we go along. So a lot of the aviation system is driven by our own fees and our own taxes on users. And that's really one of the things that's important because I know a lot of times as we look at the cost of aviation, we're a pretty self-supporting system. We do get some funding from the general. And when we get into some of these secondary funding programs that Lindsay talked about where you have CRISA, CARES Act, Supplemental, those are also funded out of the general fund, not the aviation uh, trust. Having said some of that, how, where does the money go? So when the FAA gets money, just to give you a little bit of feel, because I know under COVID, we've hear the latest, I think, $1.9 trillion. We start losing track of money and how much it means and things like that. And all this feeds into the discussion of project costs and where does that money go? So in general, for the FAA's operation, they run about $10.5 billion, or excuse me, $10.5 million a year. The Aviation Trust Fund, or you can see the grants, um, for trusts are for airport aid is actually about three and a half to 3.75, depending on any given year. And then in some of the years, we've had some additional funding that have been reallocated by Congress. So in general, here's where our funding is coming from. And so as you see this money fluctuate, it relatively has stayed stagnant for over the last 20 years which is really why we see a lot of our development getting harder and more competitive and getting funding is the value of the dollar is weaker and weaker and weaker as time goes on due to inflation and costs. Making this issue, of why do projects cost so much, even a bigger and bigger issue. And I just want to give you a feel for what some of those items are and what we're talking about when we get into that. Some of those, when we look at it, here's, here's a lot of times what maybe I think of the FAA when we look at money is, you know, hey, that Dave Anderson and his staff calls up and they have a, a grant for us. What do we see? Training money. It's great. We get our project. What does that all mean to us? So let's take a little time and step back. And I'm going to use it because I'm a simpleton as a person. 
I'm going to use it as a old habit of mine. I used to mow grass for a living. And so when you come up to me and say, Hey, we'd want you to charge to, you know, would you be willing to mow my grass? Absolutely. Well, the first question is, is, you know, how much are you willing to charge? And first question back is, is how big is your lawn? Let me look at it. Let me see what it takes. Does the size of your lawn or the size of your project impact the cost? Absolutely. It does. So the more work you got to do, the more cost it does. Pretty simple, basic concept. Like I said, I'm a simpleton, so I'm going to try to keep it as basic as possible. Let's walk into that a little bit and talk about what does that mean, the more work? What could possibly drive work? Who is one of the major funding agencies? The FAA. And we'll kind of focus on them. And it's not that I have anything against or for the FAA. It's just I know a lot about it having come from them. What's their role? They have a very, very important role and they, they do it well. So I, I do want to commend our, our fellow uh, FAA staff that are on the call. First of all, we see them a lot of times as a funding agency and we're trying to make sure that we give them all the information we can so that we can get their funding. We're going to talk a little bit later about what that is and what goes into that level of effort. Also, the FAA has a regulatory responsibility. So we have a lot of guidance for things we have to do and things we should be doing. Uh, Rebecca talked about RSAs and special programs and REs and different things like that that go into the regulatory side of it. The FAA also provides research. So they do a lot of information gathering behind the scenes to make sure that we have really good specifications that help us make better pavements, longer lasting pavements, um, that provide safer operations at the airport. They do a lot of different things ranging from, like I said, pavements to safety enhancement, things like that. So those are other things that go on in the FAA's role. And last but not least, they provide us a lot of guidance. And when I say a lot of guidance, for those of you that aren't involved in norming the regulations or the advisory circuit, we're talking uh, in the old days when I worked for the FAA, we had walls of books and binders and information. Now with everything electronically, you don't see that anymore but the same volume of information is there. And actually I would argue the volume of information has gotten even larger. These are things that we talk about when we talk about work, it's important we go through and we say, well, how does this federal agency or the FAA's role affect us? Now, let me go back to a question for the group. Do you think the FAA's rules and regulation increase the amount of work? I know when we talk to a lot of our clients, we hear a lot about, well, why do we have to do this? Can't we just do that? What do the rules say? And, and when we meet with the FAA on a regular basis, they're constantly reminding us of what the advisory circulars, their orders, the regulation, the statutes all go into as well. And I want to make it perfectly clear, I'm not trying to blame the FAA on this. They're living in the complex world that comes down through the U.S. Congress and the statutes that are put in place to make sure that we're protecting and that they're protecting the safety of the flying public. So these are things though that go into the whole program that drives again, the amount of work. Other things that people don't understand is when you're doing a project, you have to create on a regular basis, your capital improvement plan. You have to look at all those things. You have to uh, put together project justifications. You're putting together applications that are 10 to 20 pages every year. A lot of people use their consultants to do that. So you have those. And as if you guys are like a lot of people, we go through and we look at it, we put together a plan. Events change in the background. So we're constantly kind of modifying and tweaking. All that goes to adding additional work. In addition to that, one of the things the FAA has been working really hard on is, is communication and working on better and more clear, uh, concise communication. So a lot of times we have meetings with the FAA more and a lot of calls with the FAA. Again, really good things that have happened, but they add more work to the system. In addition to that, we have an ever-changing application package. They morph and change just a little bit each year. But as a lot of you know, is if you do something once, you know, you got to learn it and you do it once. Next time, if you do it again, it's a little easier and the next time a little easier yet. The FAA is constantly has rules changing on them. They're reacting by changing the rules that apply to us in the aviation community so that as consultants and as airport management, you're working on and adjusting those as well. Again, as we go through all of these, what is the net result? And again, in my from my perspective, it drives more and more work. 
So it's one of these things, again, we look at what are the things that drive cost, just in the process itself, it's a very complex situation. In addition to that, whenever you receive a grant, I know all of you guys receive grants just about every year. As you read three of those, I have up here on the screen, I'm not looking for you to read those, but the grants come with pages and pages and pages of information. It's not just information, it's rules, regulations that you as an airport sponsor have to comply with. And a lot of you hire consultants to help you comply with those as well. So that means every time you get a grant, you got to review, um, go through and review all the text, all the different requirements to make sure you're meeting the FAA's requirements. And these are actually like a contractual agreement between you and the federal government where you say, hey, they're going to give you X amount of money and in turn, you're going to abide by these rules. So again, each year you get a grant, more and more rules, more and more things to be cognizant of. In addition to the grants, we have the grant assurances. A mere 18 pages listing almost single line of rules and regulations, plus specific rules and regulations that pertain to grant assurances, how you're going to operate your airport, your airport layout plan, disadvantaged businesses, all these different things. Again, going back to our analogy, it's kind of, you know, every little bit is another piece of work added onto the stack. Well, as you go through this, many airports look at it and they go, huh, that seems like a crazy amount of things to navigate through. And this is from this picture here is from one of my favorite shows, The Princess Bride, where they're walking through this jungle and there's all these creatures and things that are uh, you have to be weary of. To me, the grant process is a little bit like that. Not that anything's going to jump out and bite you, but there's so many things to look at, to worry about, and to coordinate with. It really does appear like it's overwhelming and a little bit of a maze to get through. Again, going back to what drives project costs. So let's go back to our analogy if we can. We talked a little bit about the size of the lawn being a driver in the fact of the lawn. So if I ask you a question, I say, well, how large your lawn? And you go, hey, Tom, it's a really large lawn. Here's how many acres it is. I'd give you a price. What happens if you say, I don't know? And I know I've given this talk a couple of times over my career and people always go, hmm, what do you mean by I don't know? Well, I'm gonna get into that in just a second, but if you really don't know what's the amount of works involved and the consultants and the contractors and everybody doesn't necessarily know, do you think that uncertainty drives costs? Anybody that's in business knows that when you have a task to do and you don't know how long it's going to take you or what's in, all involved, it tends to drive some uncertainty Uncertainty drives costs. Let's talk about not knowing. What does that really mean? The FAA has been extremely busy over the last 10 years. And as I said earlier, their rules are changing. And it's not necessarily something they're doing. It's the fact that the whole system is changing, whether it's congressional uh, policies changing, whether it's statutes that are changing. But over the last seven years, the FAA has come out with 11 new standard operating procedures designed to streamline the process and make it more consistent across the country. But that's 11 new procedures. In 2019, the FAA came out with a new AIP handbook. Roughly, that's 586 pages in that handbook. In that, and this, this information straight from the FAA's advisory or, or, uh, webpage, 870 changes for the FAA were driven by that change in the order. In addition to that, and it's not a typo on here, it's 586 identified as substantial, and that's per the count of the FAA's spreadsheet. So if you think about that, in the last two years, the FAA changed the rules and they had 586 changes to their rules that they view as substantial. Hmm, how does that affect us? Well, I know everybody that's an airport director went home right away when these came out and they read the book thoroughly, probably twice, three times, just to make sure they understood them all. Uh, I can tell you when I did it back before COVID and asked this question, uh, even the FAA in the room, when I asked who read the uh, uh, order, no one in the room had read the full order. Uh, just because of my history and my background, I have read the order um, cover to cover and it's not a light read, it's not a fun read. But it is one of the things that a lot of your consultants have done because they want to provide you the best service possible. Again, these changes are driving uncertainty and they're driving more work. And it's not something that anybody's doing intentionally. It's just the world we live in. 
and the complexity of the safety environment we live in as well. Other things that go on is we have the uh, reauthorization bills that go on, and each one of those has little nuances or changes. In addition to that, um, we have the, the Supplemental Funding Program, the CARES Act Program, the CRISA. Every year we seem to have something a little new or something a little different. These are things that we all have to learn what the rules are. And I know Dave and their staff do an amazing job um, working hard to keep on top of these rules, but their world's in a dynamic state of change as well. So again, this creates uncertainty and additional workload. And that's where a lot of your airport managers are busy doing your day-to-day -day jobs and you're trusting your consultants, your state officials, your federal officials to help navigate this system. Again, these things drive additional work Every day, every day, every year, it seems like there's something new, some nuances that drive additional work. What else drives projects? You know, we talked a little bit now about consultants and helping with that and the cost of work, whether it's done by your own staff or whether it's done by consultants. We have other things that go into it that are uh, by American waivers, disadvantaged businesses where you have to review uh, all the participation and the contractors need to go out and solicit the different firms. All these things add on a little more work, a little more work here. And a lot of times the programs are not crystal clear. So you not only do you have to do the work of doing the process, you have to do the work of learning the process and understanding the rules to make sure you're in conformity with the Davis-Bacon Act, with the Disadvantaged Business Act, with the Buy American. And you have all these different things. Again, all of them have great intent they just drive additional work. So as we go through these things, these are items that make it more expensive from contractors. So when you're looking at contractors and consultants coming in with prices, we go, boy, why does it cost so much? The rules and regulations have a lot to do with that. The requirements to be certified or licensed also make those differences. As the complexity increases, the level of effort increases, this drives additional cost as well. Just to give you a little idea, right here is on the chart, and I apologize, I didn't have anything more current than this. It's a little bit of inflation versus the amount of AIP funds available. So when you look at the blue inflationary line, as I talked a little earlier, with about roughly $3.5 billion AIP funding has been relatively uh, static with, except in the middle, you'll see where uh, the Obama had some, uh, I forget the name of the program, but where they dumped in a bunch of money for, for shovel-ready projects, and I think the ARA grants, I think is what they referred to. Other than that, the system stayed pretty static. So these project costs going up are driving a lot of concern and are driving a lot of competition for projects. These are things that go into it. So as we go into these, we have to look at those complexities of project justifications because everybody's in competition for funding. And as you can see on this, the, the project costs are going up via inflation, but the amount of funding is not increasing proportionately with that. Other things that are going on is the funding's not available. We're getting into complex phasing and, and to make the projects fit within the available funding. Anytime you do break project into pieces, they drive additional complexity because how you're going to operate the airport, the uncertainty, the communications and all the different things like that. So the lack of funding sometimes drives additional project costs by adding multiple phases. In addition to that, we have quality assurance and the quality controls that the FAA has pushed over the years has gotten extremely good and our products are really good and the projects are turning out great. However, each little piece is just another brick that has to be moved in additional costs. So as we look at things that are what are driving these project costs, those are items as well that go into it. And every little piece adds on more and more. FAA specifications. The last I looked at 5370-10, which is just one advisory circular. It's the uh, specifications for construction on airports, 727 pages. And I know these are constantly in a state of being updated. So every two, three years, the FAA comes out with changes and updates. And this is just one advisory circular. There's many more that are part of this. In addition to that, in advisory circulars such as 5370-10, 
We have new and uh, increased testing requirements. We're looking for better quality material. This is one of the things where a lot of times when I was in the FAA, airports would come in and want to go into the NIPIUS or the National Plan of Integrated Airports systems and get federal funding. This is great. Once you take that step into the federal program, you have all these advisory circulars, rules and regulations you have to abide by. Those are a constant feed for rules, regulations, and increased costs. So when you come into this, they're not bad. They just drive additional fees. So as you're looking at why do we have increased project costs, whether it's contractors, consultants, um, right-of-way folks, appraisers, you name it, things are changing and adding on more and more and driving those project costs higher and higher. Um, one of the, some of the other things that go into it, in our world, we've had more and more justification requirements. As one would imagine when you have the availability of funds and its ability to purchase things is reducing. Just as I showed on the chart earlier, purchasing power is going down, which makes competition tighter. We've all heard the FA say, you know, look, we'll try to get your project for that. There's no way we can get your project for money for this. Everybody's competing. Well, what goes into that? good justification as you've listened to Lindsay, Dave, Andy, they're always saying, look, you need to give us the justification so we can fight for your projects. What does that mean? Well, you got to have proper testing. You got to have proper analysis. You got any kind of history. You can use some of the GIS that Ryan talked about where we have uh, new tools and technology that are requiring or that can use phone data, all this big data to help put justifications together. All this gets folded in so that you can compete better for your projects. These are things that drive cost as well. In addition to that, the environmental uh, element of projects. These rules and regulations have certainly have their ebbs and flows. Some have been uh, more intense, some have loosened up, and they just seem to be a little bit in a state of flux. And that's nothing wrong with that. It's just one of these things that, again, the cost of staying current with the rules, the cost of processing environmentals, and going through that. Another item is like wildlife. The FAA's efforts to make sure that we have a, a strong and vibrant aviation community, also in a manner of safe aviation community, drives the question of wildlife. What is it doing to your airport? So in this process, we've added wildlife hazard assessments, wildlife hazard management plans, and then you have the different mitigation options that go into that. So again, a whole nother field as you look at environmental, one rule, wildlife, another rule, uh, cultural reviews. We're seeing more and more, we're looking at more and more historical uh, relationships to projects, whether those are uh, people in the Native American arena or past uh, development of all sorts. What does that look like and how do we minimize those effects? All of these are really good things, but they drive additional work. And again, as we talked about, more and more work drives more and more cost. And as I said before, the robust justifications that go into it, these drive additional things. So having said that, and knowing I stand between uh, the group and uh, the end of the day, I do wanna cover just a, a quick conclusion, some of the basic fundamentals that we're seeing in project costs and what drives those is anytime you see more work, trust me, there's more increased costs. So as we work together, if there's ways we can reduce the amount of effort and the amount of work, those will help drop the project costs. Not always available to us as we look at these things, a lot of these things we don't do because we want to, we do because they're driven by certain rules and regulations. Other things we have is the new statutes, regulations and rules also drive complexity and they also drive cost. This is one of the things we often hear people talk about as our legislators create uh, different policies and different laws on things. They sound really good, but when they come out the other end, they go through into statute. Our good, good friends in the federal government have to take those statutes, turn those into rules and policies. Those turn into efforts of, of work that we have to go through and, to get a project through the system. A lot of these have the best intentions, but they do drive project costs. So as we're looking at that, 
and you hear some of them, just be cognizant of how they relate to each other. And as always, normal business procedures apply to the aviation projects. Um, inflationary costs drive project costs. Um, if those of you remember back in the oil boom in North Dakota, supply and demand. We had so much work being done because of all the oil development. There was few contractors. The prices went through the roof. I know back in the day, we saw in the western part of the state, inflationary costs that were driving project costs 60% higher than on the eastern part of the state. And that was per state analysis. So things like that drive project costs. Lack of clarity or changing. So as we sit together and we work together on a clear plan and a clear project, anything we can do to simplify it, make it clearer to the contractor, those also reduce project costs. Any lack of clarity or confusion, contractors are covering their, their backside by increasing their project costs. And again, complexity. As I talked a little bit earlier, as we do phasing of projects, that adds complexity. That complexity drives risk and safety concerns. Those all drive increased project costs as well. So anything we can do to make our projects and our phasing as simple as possible is, is saving us money in the long run. Last thing is too, is that with all the complexity, especially in smaller rural states like North Dakota and South Dakota, what we're seeing is complexity scares away uh, competition. Lack of competition drives additional costs because if, if there's less people to do it, it allows the business opportunities to charge a, a higher, higher rate. Supply and demand is alive and well. There's less people to do it and they're busier. They can charge a premium. That's one of the things we're aware of as well. So from the consulting side of the world, our job is to help minimize the complexity to the best we can for our contractors. FAA, we appreciate in the state of North Dakota, we appreciate your efforts to help work with the, the airports and the consulting staff to try to minimize any confusion and complexities in the system because all those drive additional project costs as well. Having said that, and uh, kind of going through it, we have had lopped off a, a half an hour for both Ryan and myself. I'll open it up to any questions. Uh, I have no questions at this time. Let's see, hold on one second. Yeah, none at this time. Sometimes it takes a second for him again, so if we can just get it, uh, give it one second, okay? Well, that sounds good. I went through a lot of things, so I apologize for the speed. I just, uh, I know when you sit in a, a whole day of virtual conferencing, some days it gets tiring for everybody. So 